Jai Janendra. Well, uh, I dedicate this paper to the fond memory of Thomas Burrow, who was my well-wisher. He was kind to send his books, including the Sanskrit language and the Pengo language, and papers by post, series of valuable articles under the title of Dravidian Studies appear in the Bulletin of the School of Oriental and African Studies. It was a uh, he, he was a serious student of Dravidian linguistics, and I too was a serious student, and I used to react to his writings. Unfortunately, we never met, but fortunately, we had regular letter correspondence. His handwriting, his handwriting was not good. And on my request, he mailed typed letters. <coughs> Subsequently, Thomas Burrow and Murray Barnes and MNO, MBMNO, as co-authors, published the magnum opus Dravidian Etymological Dictionary. When I published my book, Dravidian Linguistics in Canada, in 1966, both Burrow and MNO had sent their greetings, which I reproduced. My memory ponders over those inspiring days. Thanks to Padmanabh Jaini, I had the pleasure of meeting MNO in Berkeley campus of California University. Of course, MB Emino lived, he completed century, he lived for 101 years and passed away in 2005, whereas my learned friend Burrow, to whom I am dedicating this paper, passed away in 1986. <clears throat> With this introduction, current debates on the influence of Jainism on early Kanda literature. History and current debates of Jaina studies is the main theme of this year's workshop. Befitting the theme, my paper deals with current debates on the influence of Jainism on early Kanda literature. Kannada, a Dravidian language, is one of the ancient and important literary languages in India. It has a script of its own and has a population of more than 60 million. Canada had branched off from the Proto-Dravidian group in around 6th century BC and had become a written language by the beginning of Corinthia. The transformation of written language into expressive discourse and a standard literary language was achieved by Jain Saint scholars trained first in Prakrit and subsequently in Sanskrit. Key components of literary textuality like genre, grammar, lexicon, metric, and theme were suitably appropriated from Prakrit and localized. Borrowing Prakrit models was in the first phase, but in the second phase, it was from Sanskrit. This process virtually resulted in literary cultural transformation and revolution in literary matrix. Actually, it accelerated literary production and the learned began experimenting fresh genres. The lost but known commentaries of early Jain Saint scholars constitute most momentous event in the literary, cultural, political power in Karnataka and Dravida Desha. In the history of Kannada language and literature is very vast and fascinating. Though 
adequate material was easily available regrettably its salient features were not properly and systematically introduced to outside the kannada world such an objective account remained a desideratum for a long time to address the issue some attempts were made the canaries literature published in the year 1921 by e p rice has the distinction of being the earliest book in english on kannada literature but the author failed to grasp the heart and soul of kannada literary culture he misled non kannada readers into ignoring or misunderstanding or underestimating the mystery the mastery originality and genius of kannada poets subsequently professor salatore stefan anekar stressed the need to assess the rarity of kannada literature the english writings of narsimachar mogali sita ramayana and many others and recently vivek rai and ramachandran are noteworthy in filling the void to a great extent the credit of establishing kannada as one of the foremost literary languages of far greater significance goes to sheldon pollock admiringly overcoming the lacuna he has remarkably narrated the history and described the core characteristics of kannada literature his insightful and graphic picture of kannada literary world is extraordinary he has successfully accomplished the task that was long due glory and singularity of kannada world language literature culture polity religion geography royal dynasties land and people in brief was never presented and projected in this manner the author has cast floodlight eminently and done justice to kannada and karnataka this paper mainly deals with the subject with special reference to sheldon pollock's book language of gods in the world of men devabashi <clears throat> the book has a vast canvas its macro and micro study covers a wide spectrum of southeast asia the author concentrates around the beginning of second millennium despite absence of tangible textual details fairly good account of the first millennium is extant and deserves to be examined as authentic fossil about 50 pages in the chapter 9 creating a regional world the case of canada <clears throat> from pages 330 to 379 are devoted exclusively to trace historical development of canada befittingly references to canada language culture and polity and literature galore from ab initio to ad finam the antiquity density historicity sociology literary production and associated accomplishments are recorded quote the very first canada inscription of all the halmidi record that is the earliest extant kannada inscription halmidi record which begins with a benedictory verse addressed to vishnu and commemorates a man famed for his munificence in bestowing a ritual victim for many sacrifices hardly the product of a jain cultural environment this is pollock's i i quote and unquote now the shortcomings in this statement are glaring 
two of the five dynasties mentioned in the inscription are Sendrakas and Kelas. The roots of the Sendrakas, one of the ancient Kshatriya dynasties and feudatories of Banavasi Kadambas, are far deeper and go back to third century. The Gokak plates of Deja Maharaja, king of Rashtrakuta of Manpura house, established that the Sendrakas were Jains from the beginning and belonged to Vardhamana lineage. It is from one of my books. Palakeshin, king of the Chalukyas of Badami, was son of Sendraka princess. And King Kir Kirtivarman had married sister of Srivallabha Senananda, chief of Sendraka Vamsa. This is from an my another book. Vija Arasa, to whom the honor was bestowed, was son of Sarakella of Kella family. P. N. Narsimha Murthy, famous historian, has in one of his research papers on this subject affirmed, I quote, the Kellas were Jains and they figure first in the Halmidi inscription of Kannada Kakustavarma, Kadabba Kakustavarma, unquote. And they originally belonged to, again I quote, village named Kella Puttige, giving due recognition to that meritorious family of Jain rulers, unquote. M.B. Neginahala, well-known Kanda scholar, established that Vija Arasa, son of Sarakella, belonged to the ancient Jaina family. He also discovered an inscription which clearly established that Jainism and Jaina monks had rooted in the South Kendra coastal region before 5th century. Murugesha Verma, the Adi Kadumba king of Banavasi, in his eighth Rignalaya, that is 462, built a Jinalaya at Palashika, modern Halsi, for the merit of his grandfather, Karayitva Jinalayam Sri Vijaya Palashikayam, unquote, and donated 33 Nivartanas land to the Yapaniyas, Nirgrantas, Shvetapatas, and Kurchakas. The Donis were Damakirti and Jayanta. This affirms that these subsects of Jainism were popular and earned higher status to receive royal endowments. The Hosakote inscription of King Avinita states that King Simhavarma's mother caused to be made a Jinamandira for the welfare of her husband and for the worship and for the worship of the Yapaniyas. On the advice of his Jaina teacher Vijayakirti, King Avinita endowed the temple. So Sheldon Pollock has failed to recognize these details and to record these details. If he were to really record these details, that would have strengthened the cause, how the Jains participated and promoted in the early phase of Kanda literature. And particularly, um, Pollock could not trace the details about the Shvetapatas. Shvetambaras, also they were there in Karnataka as early as in the 5th century AD. This has come this has not come to the notice of Sheldon Pollock. And then the statement of Pollock, quote, early Kanda literature often has little or nothing to do with Jainism. This is false and very defective. Pollock, in making this wrong statement, erred in his assessment. Before jumping to this conclusion, he seems to have been unaware of some very important evidences. He has not established how early Kanda literature has little or nothing to do with Jainism. Now, it is left for us to prove how this statement is unsustainable. Let us examine early Kanda literature. Not only Kanda literature, but also Karnataka was an abode of Jainism as testified by epigraphical evidences. 
inscriptions, oath, Jainism's opulence in the state, prominent historian Salatore, and his famous book, Medieval Jainism, figure in the bibliography, but its useful and reliable information relevant to SP's discussion is not availed. Astonishingly, similar instances are not lacking where easily accessible and known facts in favor of Jainism imprints are marginalized. On the whole, the details in pages between 423 and 428 are unnecessary elaboration and gives an impression that the author is vehemently arguing to marginalize Jaina achievements. By this unwarranted statements, Pollock's train has lost a track or derailed. I would like to show how he has erred and he is not aware of important facts. Inscriptions with invocation to Jina or Jainism are innumerable and they emerge from 5th and 6th century. These important hymns provide deep and direct insight into the religious experiences of Jains. I quote, Jaina inscriptions have certain special characteristics which distinguish them from others. These inscriptions and the invocatory verses have, in their own way, enriched Kannada language and literature, and they are the forerunners of later such writings. This is, this is a quotation from one of my books. Such poems, I quote, such poems tell us more about the general devotional ethos of medieval Digambara Jainism than the more philosophical text upon which scholarship has tended to, uh, tended to concentrate. This is a quotation from Dr. Paul Dundas uh, in his blurb that he wrote to one of, one of my works. There is also much to be learned from studying them as examples of that most ubiquitous of Jaina genres, the Jinendra Stavana. This is from the introduction to my book by John E. Court, who is present here. Kelting M. Whitney and Glenn Yokum have shown that it is important to study hymns in all languages in India. I skip some paragraphs and pages because I, have, I am expected to uh, speak for only for 30 minutes, right? Yeah, so, yes. So you have about seven more minutes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And then, uh, the Kandra country becoming an abode of Jainism is not a secret. It's a Catholicity made it dear to Kanda people. They never hesitated to seek corrections from experts in the field. The learned more, from the more learned, some writers have acknowledged the names of experts who vetted their works. Ranna, for example. Research scholars of eminence have noted time and again that the earliest cultivators of Kannada language were Jains, the oldest works of any extent and value that have come down to us are all from the pen of Jains. The period of Jains' predominance in the literary field may just, justly be called the Augustan age of Kanda literature. <clears throat> Tamil literary culture owes its beginnings to Jain writers. I quote, no survey of Jainism in Tamil country, however brief, will be complete without mentioning the enormous contribution made by the Jains to the growth of Tamil literature from the earliest times up to about 16th century AD. While justice cannot be done to this vast subject within the scope of present study, Mention must be made at least of such outstanding works by Jaina authors like Tulagopiyam and Nannul among the grammatical works, Shilapidi Garam, Jivaka Chintamani and Perungatai among the epics, the immortal Kural of Naladiyar among the ethical works, and Divakaran 
and then pingalat i and chudamani among the lexicons to this already formidable record may be added what is surely the most basic and fundamental contribution by the jaidam marx to tamil namely the development of a script the development of a script for the language leading to literacy and the later efflorescence of shangam literature in the early centuries centuries and and quote this is from mahadevan airavatam uh, this article is included in the volume swasti so ably edited by nalini balbi mahadevan on the basis of inscriptions has proved beyond doubt that one Jainism entered Tamil country before 3rd century BC. Number 2, Jainism reached Tamil country through Karnataka. Number 3, early lithic records in the caves belong to the period before the schism between the Digambara and Shwetambara sects. Number 4, the Tamil Brahmi inscriptions are anterior to the earliest known Kannada inscriptions and literature. five lexical items and grammatical usages or 20 minutes more oh so kind of you <laughs> it, would, it would be wonderful if we had 20 minutes more this is fascinating oh, five, five minutes, minutes. five more minutes oh you could have been more kind to me <laughs> okay thank you thank you thank the you problem, of course, is i the respect the speaker <laughs> <laughs> okay then I skip off many pages, as many. Uh, well, ma- many mistakes are there. Many mistakes are there, and then uh, Pollock says that Mathura, Mathura, is a strong uh, center for uh, Vedic religion. But actually, in 1970s and 60s, excavations were conducted by the Archaeological Survey of India, and looters. has published the details about the items the materials found there the images and the inscribed sculptures and all that and surprisingly out of 185 images and sculptures discovered at mathura 89 are of jaina affiliation and then 60 are of buddhist affiliation and none of them belong to vedic religion therefore we we can establish with so many instances and examples how pollock has um, erred and it is for him to uh, rectify uh, the defects that that i have in detail explained with facts and figures and to conclude no very important items are there okay he has asked some uh, not in good taste some questions and he says why did they not write in vernacular languages earlier and why did they write in sanskrit absolutely absurd he should not have asked such questions it's in none of his business <laughs> i will conclude okay the, the, when when it is published peter will publish it in fact um, i should thank peter um, flugal ji because it is he who suggested me and he was kind enough to also provide me with the original text so that i could go through in detail it, it's a very important book i know but as far as the, his chapter on karnataka and jainism or concern i should um, make it clear to the audience that uh, he is he has not made a good study of jainism and so much is to be done beginning of sanskrit kannada grammar call 14 yes therefore i conclude uh, therefore <laughs> readers of this book have got to be cautious before accepting some of the conclusions despite 
commissions and omissions, it should be placed on record that Sheldon Pollock has done a great service to Kanda language and literature. I do not think that there is another book on the subject of this standard. There may be excellent books on our monographs on the language, literature, culture and polity of each state and country, either in English or in other local languages, albeit a comprehensive work of this magnitude covering entire southern Asia looks like unwritten so far. Kudos to Sheldon Pollock for successfully accomplishing this Herculean task. Pollock has not recorded importance of Jinavallava, younger brother of Pampa, who wrote hundred years before Nannaya Bhatta. Jinavallava, an adept in Kannada, Telugu and Sanskrit, scripted the famous Kurkyal inscription. His devotion and command over Kanda literature and political history is transparent. He quotes from local classics and gives English translation, thus readers experience a taste of Kannada. While giving so much appreciation for the excellent work uh, Pollock, Sheldon Pollock has done, there are also areas where the, some uh, correction should be incorporated. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's a very, very long uh, uh, essay or paper. I request Peter to publish this. When it is published, you will come to know uh, I, I am not biased. When I am passing any remark on Sheldon Pollock, I do it based on actual extant facts and figures. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much, Christy, and thank you very much, Peter, for having invited me to this um, conference. Uh, maybe my paper is not going to be as uh, funny and as ambitious as Professor Hampanadvi's, but I will try to uh, say something. And uh, so in this context of, of this workshop, uh, which is the 20th of this kind, I would like first to start by presenting a sketchy view of the state of art in the field of my topic today, namely the Jain books of discipline. This phrase, books of discipline, which is borrowed from the title of the Pali Vinaya translation by I.B. Horner, seems adequate to designate in a slightly less cryptic way for the outside world the textual class known among the Jains as Cheda Sutras. Note that these works and the Vinaya can be superposed, but at least roughly, there are some shared concerns in both. For a great part, however, the degree of technicity exhibited by the Cheda Sutras is extremely striking. As a category, the Cheda Sutras have a particular status within the Shvetambara Agamas as far as their study by monastics is concerned. It is not advised to make them accessible to any uh, people, everyone. Now, in the history uh, of Jain studies, the Cheda Sutras have been an area of growing interest in the last hundred years. I will confine myself to some landmarks in this history. At the end of the 19th and beginning of 20th century, if we accept the first Indian printed editions of the Jain Agamas, where some of these texts were included, the leading works are those authored by Ernst Leumann and Walter Schubring. The former studied in particular the Jita Kalpa Bhashya, and the latter devoted his doctoral thesis to an edition, German translation, and glossary of the Kalpa Sutra, not the Barasa Sutra, which is used in pollution, but the set of rules of conduct prescribed to monks, including specifications for nuns, without any narrative frame. Schubring's monograph was later accessible through an English translation of the German published in the Indian Antiquary. The same scholar then published the critical edition of the Vyavahara and the Nishitha Sutra. It is interesting to see that Schubring's Roman editions were transposed in Nagari and published in India in the 1920s, providing an instance of scholarly communication between Europe and India, 
through the agency of the Jain Sahitya Samshodhak Samiti. With the addition of the Achara Dasha, uh, the Vyavahara and the Nishita formed the Dray Cheda Sutras published by Shubring and his disciple Colette Kaya, whose monograph on atonements, first published in French and translated into English, is a seminal study on the core concern of this type of literature, the prior tittas, atonements or expiations. The majorities of the studies mentioned so far relate to the sutra themselves in Ardha Magati, which represent the first layer of these books of discipline. They need to be supplemented, however, by the exegetical literature formed around them, the bhashyas, the verse commentaries, which in the case of Cheda literature are especially long and complex, themselves explained by Sanskrit commentaries. The editions of works belonging to this textual layer, that is the bhashyas, were exclusively produced in India and often managed by highly qualified representatives of the monastic community. The first ones were published during the first decades of the 20th century. Muni Chatur Vijaya and Muni Punya Vijaya's edition in six volumes of the Brihat Kalpa Bhashya is a climax in quality, whereas the edition of the Nishita Bhashya rather illustrates the opposite. The Vyavahara Bhashya edition published in the 1920s was not widely distributed and soon became difficult to get. But in the last 15, 20 years, these bulky and difficult works have happily raised the interest of a new generation of monastics from various sectarian backgrounds. Vijaya Munichandra Suri, for instance, who can be considered as a successor to the late Muni Jambu Vijaya in editing and publishing Shwetambara Agamas, has provided a new edition of the Vyavahara Sutra, Bhashya and Commentary. The Therapant Acharya Tulsi, who since long has distinguished itself as a promoter of Agama publications, has also done a tremendous work in the last decades as far as the edition and Hindi translation of Cheda literature are concerned. Samani Kusum Pragya, in particular, is the hard-working and expert figure who has been involved alone or in collaboration in the publication of the Vyavahara Bhashya with translation, the Jita Kalpa Bhashya, and also the Pancha Kalpa Bhashya. The latter was hardly accessible before the Lad Noon edition. Anybody willing to read these Bhashyas has to use these fully equipped books. But working editions in Roman script, such as the Brihat Kalpa Bhashya text with a selective glossary provided by Professor Willem Bolle, are useful, as well as the partial translations of the Vyavahara Bhashya or the survey of its narratives given by the same scholar. As we see, furnishing full textual material in a form as, ad as adequate as possible has been a heavy trend in Cheda Sutra studies, which has been followed both by Western and Indian scholars, the latter increasingly in recent decades. Reflection around the textual tradition of these texts remains at the center today. In Japan, a courageous study group organizes regular reading sessions around the Vyavahara Bhashya, for instance. Another uh, direction of research relates to the technical vocabulary used in the Jain books of discipline and its comparison with Buddhist terminology. This has been illustrated by the recent monograph of, on Sambhoga, the participation in the common supplies of a religious community with food and clothes, the affiliation with the religious order, authored by Hayan Hoof and Hinuber in 2016, or by my own discussion on the Prakrit term U Baddha, corresponding to Pali Uttu Baddha, widely used in the Cheda literature to refer to the, to the eight months of the year outside the four months of the rainy season. Finally, increasing interest is shown in the understanding of these texts for gaining a better knowledge of the life of monastic communities. In their own way, SBDO's classics, History of Jaina Monachism, and Jaina monastic jurisprudence had broadly paved the way, showing the amount of material available in the Bhashyas especially. But this still needs to be investigated deeper. In addition, 
both ethnographic studies dealing with the life of contemporary Jain monastic communities in India, such as Anne Vallely's Guardians of the Transcendent, based on fieldwork among Therapanthi ascetics, and exploration of Buddhist literature following the path led, for example, by Gregory Chopin, have inspired thorough thematic studies based on reading of the Jain Bhashyas. An exemplary result, in my opinion, is Mary, Mary Yvesiovi's dissertation on nuns, as well as her article, Mendicants and Medicine, Ayurveda in Jain Monastic Texts. There, she convincingly shows how the Bhashyas, which can be ascribed to the 6th, 7th century CE, depart from canonical sutras in clearly addressing the issues of care and medicine in daily contexts, and how they display familiarity with Ayurvedic knowledge, which was there at that time. This implies disentangling the complex intertextual relationships between the various bhashyas as they present a large amount of overlapping material, building a corpus rather than boundary-tight texts. The books of discipline I mentioned so far are those which deal with monastic life and especially atonements prescribed for the breaches in aspects of conduct of the ascetics among the Shritambaras. There are, however, two connected areas which are not covered by them, atonements for the laity and atonements among the Digambaras. The first one was the topic of the paper I, give here, I gave here itself in 2009, which was later published in Jaina Scriptures and Philosophy as a felicitation volume to Professor Bollet. I focused mainly on two unpublished Prakrit tracts, an anonymous Savaya Pachitta, evidenced by two palm leaf manuscripts, one of them in the British Library, and a work of the same title by the Shvetambara monk Tilakacharya, which I edited and translated. I tried to put them in context, including other pieces independent or present in larger works dealing with the same topic, that is lay atonement. The atonements prescribed for the laity in these texts are described with the same technical language used in the Cheda Bhashyas proper, especially the Jita Kalpa Bhashya. These works did not seem to have circulated widely, and I tried to argue that their relative neglect could be explained by their complexity and the difficulty of their practical use. They could have been superseded in practice by the Pratikramana Sutra, which covers all the areas of ethics and forms the core of Jain liturgy. Today, I wish to discuss the third component of this corpus, the Digambara material dealing with atonements, which seems to have been rather understudied so far. In the earlier textual strata, of which the Mulachara can be taken as a good representative, Prakrit Payat Chitta comes as a subdivision of internal ascetic practices that is within the discussion of Prakrit Tavo, which is recognized as having six in external aspects and six internal aspects. This is the classical doctrine, well known from Shvetambara scriptures as well, starting from the Stananga Sutra, the Aupapatika Sutra, and so on. Thus, we read in the Mulachara that atonement uh, appears as the first form of internal asceticism. Atonement as the, as, is the ascetic practice by which one is cleaned, purified from evil done previously, and atonement is being tenfold. You can see the, I mean, the stanzas uh, in front of you, but I cannot uh, read them. There is no time. Then comes the list uh, of the ten uh, atonements, which can be translated as, uh, roughly as follows. Confession, repentance, combination of both, restitution, abandonment of the body, asceticism, reduction of seniority, complete reduction of seniority and re-initiation, isolation and restating faith. In the corresponding Shvetambara lists, the last two terms are anavasthapya, temporary exclusion and re-initiation, and paranchita, ex exclusion with or without the possibility of re-initiation after self-criticism. The difference in uh, termin of terminology is worth noting, but it is not sure that the realities referred to are basically different in the two traditions. The modes of parihara in the mulachara are of two kinds. If the transgression is the result of negligence, the culprit performs the penance in his own gana, in his, uh, in his own monastic group. He bows to juniors, does not receive salutations, and practices fasts. Thus, 
he is isolated symbolically. If the transgression is the result of pride, he performs the penance by changing his monastic group and he's guided by another teacher or successively different teachers before coming back to the first. Hence, his isolation from the original group is temporary. The last term in this list, Saddharna, face, or rather restating face, focuses on the positive result which might come in the end, but implies total excommunication from the group involving a solemn reordination where the culprit has to express his belief in fundamental principles all over again. The last step in the Mulachara exposition is the list of designations of the co key concept atonement. So you have the ter terms here, which mean destroying old karmas, rejecting, eliminating, purifying, washing, uh, wiping, removing, cutting. Uh, these are the names uh, given to uh, atonement. And that's all fundamentally which we have in the older strata of scripture of the Digambaras. Now, if there was really no other material, I would perhaps not have decided to speak about these Digambara atonements at all. But we have, we have a collection of four texts which was published in 1921 under the title Prayash Chitta Samgraha. My attention was drawn to it by our energetic friend Manish Modi in Mumbai, who some years ago simply handed over to me a complete photocopy and trusting to me the task of making something out of it. Recently, Manish expressed his wish again, thinking, he said, it would be useful to make this text known in the light of recent rules-breaking incidents for which various Jain monks have been reported to be responsible. Rules-breaking incidents, or rather scandals, which the internet has contributed to make known through videos on YouTube. For example, a monk was caught red-handed by a camera while eating mutton chops and onions. Others were accused of rape of young devotees or candidates to Diksha, with one of them in jail. Now, whether any connection can be drawn between today's events that are to be sanctioned mostly by punishments provisioned by common Indian law and penances that were meant to be prescribed within the boundaries of the monastic community is indeed a question. But reading these works is certainly not without interest as they enlarge the Jain corpus of treatises on atonements. In this preliminary presentation, I will try to outline their main features and the questions they raise. So you see the names of these works here. I leave the last one aside for today, but the three other texts can be described as a corpus. They have been transmitted separately from each other in the manuscript evidence, which is rather meager anyway. But reading them together shows that they go back to a similar ins inspiration. In short, we can say that the Cheda Satta is a concise version of what is found expanded in the Cheda Binda and the Prayash Chitta Chulika is a Sanskrit version sharing material and wording with both of the Prakrit texts. The style is rather abrupt and is similar to the Bhashya style of equivalent Shvetambara literature. All three works are structured in the same way, the organizing principle being the Digambara key concept of Mulaganas, which is the Mulaguna, sorry, which is thus defined at the outset of the Mulachara, for instance. So it comprises the uh, five great vows, the five precautions, samiti, the five um, um, uh, control of the five senses, the six essential duties, plucking out of the air, a uh, question relating to nudity, not taking a bath, uh, sleeping um, on the earth, on the ground, not uh, brushing teeth, um, eating standing, and eating one day, uh, I mean once a day. The status of the prohibition of eating after sunset is ambiguous. The Mulachara commentary on this verse clearly states that Prakrit Ya, Sanskrit Ta, has to be understood in the restrictive meaning of Eva, thus only five and not six. Later on in the text, though, the topic of night eating is addressed and justified as being a protection of the five major vows. For the Digambara works on atonement, this is no longer an issue, what relates to night eating is included in the general scheme which you, which you see here. The main purpose is to expose a treatise meant for the purification of monks, Sahunam Suhanatanam. 
but all three works also devote a short section to nuns designated by, the, by Prakrit Savani or Adda and another one to the laity. The gist of it is that atonements for nuns are to be prescribed by the male leader of the group to which they belong. The areas dealt with briefly relate to washing the robe or the arms bowl. The general principles of exposition that are familiar from the Shwetambara Cheda Bhashyas are also present here. There are two causes of wrong action which will call for a compensation, either carelessness, Prakrit Pamada, or pride, arrogance, Prakrit Dappa. This is a basic criterion for assessing the seriousness of the atonement. Another one relates to the frequency of the lapses. Did it happen once, ekavaram, or several times, bahuvaram? An atonement is different from a punishment as it is meant to clean or purify and put the culprit on the right path again. So a correct evaluation in light of the culprit's personal situation is required, for instance, in case of illness. The scale of atonements stated at the outset of the work is also similar to what is found, to, um, what is found in the Cheda Bhashyas, including recitation of namaskaras, practicing kayotsargas, and a wide range of dietary restrictions in the quantity and quality of elements, up to complete fasts of uh, various durations. There are also equivalences between these various um, categories. For instance, nine namaskaras are equal to one kayotsarga. None of the three works refers to the others. Nevertheless, they have strong intertextual relationships. Several cases of verse correspondences are one of the forms this inter interconnection uh, takes. Uh, so I will not uh, go into the detail, but I wanted to take this uh, example, the treatment of locha plucking out of the air, of the hair, uh, where you have an identical verse in the Treda Satta in Prakrit and in the uh, Prayaschitta Chulika um, in Sanskrit. The concise and even cryptic style is that of Bhashya verses, where the main format is that of lists. The order of terms is significant, as each term of list A corresponds to the respective term of list B in increasing degree of seriousness in the offense. The syntactic relations are not always transparent, and the technical terms designating the atonements may have synonyms. Against this, the Cheda Pinda has four verses, one of which gives a variant introduced by the phrase Anne Bhananti, others say, stating that whoever does not prescribe the proper atonement will incur reduction of seniority. The expression of divergences in atonements to be prescribed is a recurring feature in, the, in these texts. Their agenda is to cover systematically and rigorously all possible breaks in conduct and compensations for them. University in the correspondence between breaks and compensations would then seem a prerequisite. But fluctuations are also not excluded. On the one hand, the authors, whoever they are, claim the authority of early teachers, as usual, and of experts in the field of atonements. On the other, they are well aware that how many situations they may consider, exhaustiveness is impossible to reach. The format the study will take when completed is not yet clear. Even the few instances I have given would show that a mere translation of such texts is hardly meaningful or it has to be heavily annotated. For now, I would just like to uh, conclude uh, by focusing on a few questions these works raise. Internal criteria for the Digambara identity are the fact that they follow the scheme of the Mulagunas in the exposition, the use of Prakrit Adja as the designation for nuns, and an isolated mention of the picture, peacock feather, in the discussion of the Iria uh, Samiti. Um, so far, external criteria are very fragile, as both authorship and dates of these works are either unknown or more than tentative. A future, a future task worth doing in connection with this project would be to try to locate more manuscripts in the Gambara libraries. On the other hand, there are indications in the text pointing to what could be innovations connected with the influence of a social religious environment marked by the presence of Hinduism. For example, murder of a cow occurs in the list of crimes 
relating to the murder of living beings, after that of a Jain monk, a layman, a child, and a lady. References to members of the four Varnas with their usual designations, as well as mention of the custom of head shaving, Sira Mundana in the lay section, um, and atonements to be performed in case an ascetic has touched an outcast, also suggest the same, although one has to remain cautious in these matters. To conclude, the three texts under consideration appear as hanging bhashyas, not depending on known sutra texts. The material they discuss and their ways of exposition are akin to Shwetambara Cheda Bhashyas, especially the Tita Kalpa, which is devoted to the discussion of atonements. The position of the Digambara works within the Jain tradition is not fully clear. Would there be innovations modeled after or influenced by their Shwetambara counterparts? Uh, the hundred verse accretion commenting upon the ten atonements of the Mulachara found in one of the works uh, ends saying, thus the tenfold set of atonements has been told in the Kappa and Vavahara. It is said that it should be given by the teacher with awareness of the differences between persons with respect to custom. This is the translation of the last uh, stanza here. I would think that Kappa, Vavahara and Gita refer here to a Digambara tradition of these texts and uh, view our three works as repositories handing knowledge which was necessary for codifying lapses and compensations in monastic life among Digambaras. Challenging as they are because of their cryptic style, they could function as large-scale memos which were actually used by teachers combined with their own experience. We have instances of such atonements uh, guidebooks uh, about um, atonements today. For example, here I refer briefly to uh, the um, work studied by Peter Flugel about Terapant Prayaschitta Vidhi, which was uh, composed by Acharya Tulsi in 1960. And just to finish with this, this is a, 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 a page in a, a notebook belonging to a Shwetambara monk in Gujarati script, which is based on an old manuscript and which this monk said uh, is used by him to uh, give ex uh, atonements to his disciples. So, I mean, there, is some, there are some hints that these works could be used uh, in practice. This has to be explored also in the Digambara context, which I have not been able to do so far. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry with the one mic. Good morning. Um, I will start uh, with a brief survey of Jane ontology, which will be needed to analyze uh, the work ascribed to Kunda Kunda. Uh, and uh, my purpose is to show that the corpus of works which are ascribed to Kunda Kunda, uh, the, this is a collection of uh, various minor works which were put together. Uh, these works were composed from around 3rd century CE to 7th, 8th century CE. Um, and Kunda Kunda as an author as such did not exist. He existed as a collective author. I didn't want to say that there was nobody named Kunda Kunda, but there was no one author uh, known as Kunda Kunda who uh, penned all these works ascribed to him. Uh, my second goal is to show that uh, well, to point who a compiler of these works was, uh, and then also to provide some reasons why such a compilation uh, process was undertaken, uh, a process which brought Kunda Kunda uh, to the rank of one, perhaps, of the most celebrated Digamba thinkers. Uh, I will focus on Panchastikaya Sangraha, but uh, the same remarks will hold valid for some of other works. Um, but as, as I say, I have to start first with, with a brief uh, survey of ontology. I will skip uh, detailed methodological notes. Uh, this survey of um, uh, ontology will be an important element, but I will also use other um, 
kinds of approach, like the style, uh, continuity of narration, certain jumps in narration of the text. Um, in terms of ontology, basically, I will present some basic models that the Jains have developed um, uh, to deal with the structure of the world. These models serve them to explain the structure of the world. Basically, all these models are dualistic. Uh, they divide the world, the beings, into living elements and lifeless elements, jiva and ajiva. Uh, the first model, uh, historically the first model, uh, divides everything to living beings and lifeless elements, jiva, ajiva. Um, it is... Uh, not present in a complete form because this model was later uh, in the practice of composition and expanding text uh, elaborated new elements were added but this is basically uh, the model which we can grasp from the oldest strata of giant texts uh, we see uh, the principle of motion rest the dharma dharma akasha pudgala um, the second model Slightly later, but not much later, it ran parallel. It uh, divides uh, everything into tatwas or tathyas, the living beings, lifeless elements, and we have asrava, bandha, samvara, nirjara, moksha, and then punya, papa are added. Uh, the third model is very important. Um, it uh, describes the world or divides all entities into extensive, extensive entities, astikaya. So, jiva astikaya, pudgala astikaya, dharma adharma akasha astikaya. Um, what is interesting about this model is that it was a genuine uh, model developed by the Jains, parallel to, uh, for instance, um, padarthas in the Vaisheshika system or the dharmas in Abhidharma uh, Buddhism. Um, in philosophical terms, it was quite a vital step of abstraction. Um, and the Jains themselves must have been aware that this was a kind of novelty not understood by um, other systems. These terms were novel completely. Um, there is an interesting story in uh, the Bhagavati Sutra which describes uh, how this um, uh, model was introduced and uh, perhaps I read a uh, passage from, from, from um, uh, Bhagavati Sutra. Uh, thus, this ascetic Jnatri Putra, Zvardhamana, teaches the five extensive entities, namely Dharma, Adharma and so on. Um, so these are, in fact, this uh, description of the model is debated among non-Jain uh, ascetics. And then these Jain ascetics see um, uh, Indra Bhuti Gautama passing by and they all say, oh well, let's go to him and ask actually what the Jains mean by this model. So this interesting story shows that Jains were aware that it was a kind of novelty. The model is preserved in a modified form uh, by Umasvati's, in Umasvati's Tatvartha Sutra, where um, the first astikaya is removed. We have only five astikayas. Jiva astikaya is not present in the Tatvartha Sutra. Uh, the fourth model uh, is uh, about, well, we could say, uh, the components of the world. Uh, it seems to be very similar to model one. We have jiva, but then we have dharma, adharma, akasha, pudgala, and kala. Conspicuously, ajiva is missing. If we go back to model one, uh, on the left we have Jiva, on the right we have Ajiva, and then subdivisions of Dharma, Dharma, Kasha, Pudgala. We could argue that model four should be earlier because we have no Ajiva, but in fact it seems to be an elaboration, a simplification of model one, and there is a conspicuous element of Kala time, uh, which was introduced to Jain ontology much later. So this is a later uh, model. And then model uh, the fifth model 
is again very important. It's, uh, it is uh, the model of substances. Clearly, it is a borrowing from uh, the Vaisheshika uh, tradition, so in a way it's a foreign uh, element in, in Jain ontology. Uh, the term dravya is introduced, but most of the other items are similar. Jiva, dharma, adharma, akasha, pudgala, and sometimes kala, we have it uh, in, uh, we have this in uh, the Tatvartha Sutra and in both commentaries, uh, uh, Tatvartha Digama Bhashya and uh, uh, Sarvartha Siddhi. Um, now, to recapitulate, this is the first model again, Jiva, Ajiva, and its four subdivisions, and all the models um, together with the dating. Um, these models can be very handy to analyze texts um, and can be applied uh, uh, practically to determine, as a method to determine the cohesion of, and integrity of a particular text. What is important that these models, each of them presents uh, an integral picture of, of ontology. So normally they should not overlap. In texts, they do, and when they do overlap, uh, when we find Astikayas and Dravyas side by side, it's always a symptom that the text was amended, expanded, and new elements were added to an earlier ontology. Uh, this is very important, and again, uh, well, to give you an example, for instance, if we uh, find a classification of substances, Dravyas uh, in a particular passage, that, that means that this passage cannot be earlier than around 400 CE. Um, if, and similarly, if we find a reference to Kala, time, as a substance, similarly, this uh, passage cannot be older than 400 CE. Uh, let's go now to the works of Kunda Kunda. 484 I ascribe to him, but this is uh, an unrealistic uh, number, uh, it's, the number is fictitious. Uh, in fact, we can speak of three, in my opinion, of, of three works which can consistently be ascribed to what I call collective author Kunda Kunda. Uh, this is the uh, Pachatiya Sangaha, uh, Pavayana Sangha, uh, Sara, and Samaya Sara. The reasons uh, are more, but these are the only three texts which um, are commented by Amrita Chandra and by Jayasena. And they are all collected in a similar pattern. They, these two commentators, Amrita Chandra, 10th century, they do not comment on other texts of um, Kunda Kunda. Uh, perhaps Niyamasara and Atapauda uh, show certain similarity in structure which can be linked to these three texts. Now I'll go uh, to uh, the main focus for today, to Panchastikaya Sangraha. Uh, as the title suggests, uh, this is a text uh, on, uh, which, which is based uh, on model which I call number four, I think, uh, was it? Uh, mo model uh, three, yes. Um, in, its, in the form in which it is preserved in, uh, manu in, in, in uh, the manuscripts uh, and in the editions, uh, it, is, it consists of three chapters. Uh, the titles of these chapters are the f uh, first collection of sermons on six substances and five extensive entities. Uh, uh, the titles are given by commentators. Uh, a commentary on nine categories and minor chapter uh, demonstrating the expanse of the path of uh, liberation. Mm. This, well, I will now shift to uh, the Prakrit text. Okay. Uh, I will not analyze all almost 200 gathas. We don't have time for that, but I do it in my paper. I go gatha by gatha, analyzing its structure. Um, The first two gathas are 
uh, the, the, the beginning uh, of the text, eulogy, uh, and uh, this, they, they um, um, present the obeisance paid to, to, to Gina and his teachings. Gatha three uh, is the proper introduction to the text. I won't be translating these or reading them, I'll just give a brief survey. So Gatha 3 is a proper introduction to the text. It speaks of the combination, Samavao, of five extensive entities which are reflected in the title of the text, Panchastikaya. Uh, and these are the doctrinal uh, system, uh, Samau Samaya, uh, and they make the world law, Loka. Um, so this is a co quite consistent, consistent with the title of the work, which is supposed to deal with, with uh, the five uh, astikayas. Uh, the subsequent gathas, four or five, uh, they deal with uh, uh, these astikayas, with jiva, they enumerate them, jiva, putgala, dharma, dharma, uh, akasha, ayasa. Uh, now, Gatha, the whole passage from Gatha 6 uh, up to definitely 14, but probably again up to 21, uh, is a later addition. Um, because, well, Gatha 6 relates these five extensive entities by mentioning that they. Uh, Endure in time, Tekaliya uh, Bhava Parinada and the Strikalika Bhava Parinata, and at the same time they remain permanent. Uh, this is a reference to time. This kind of debate is not discussed at an early point of time, and it clearly shows that these are linked to time and the concept of, of Kala as. Uh, um, uh, as a kind of substance. Uh, so this has to be later uh, addition to, um, to the earlier portion of the text. Uh, Gatha 7 uh, mentions existence satta, uh, which is, uh, importantly, which is located in um, uh, all padas, uh, sava payatha. Uh, this is a reference that is in padas places, but padas seems to be a reference to padartha, vaisheshika padartha. Importantly, satta is an important uh, category of the vaisheshika system. So we have satta as, as a vaisheshika term, uh, as a vaisheshika category, padartha or tatwa, and we have a reference to padas, or padarthas of the Vaisheshika system. So again, it has to be a later interpolation in the text, which refers no, more, no longer to astikayas, but to uh, uh, the later ontological system of uh, dravyas. Um, what is important, the relation, the Vaisheshika, the Vaisheshika itself speaks of satta, of existence, uh, in hearing by the relation of Samavaya in Padarthas. But the term Pada or Padartha is not present in the Vaisheshika Sutra. It is introduced only in, uh, uh, by Prashasta Pada in his Bhashya, which is around 450. So this Gatha has to be later than 450, since it refers to Vaisheshika ontology, which was constructed around the time, around the mid 5th century. Um, then the passage also um, in, I'll go on to Gatha 15. There's much to say about each of these Gathas, but Gatha 15 will speak of Gunas. We are used that Gunas are part, Gunas, sub, well, Dravyas, Gunas, and Pariyas are a part of Jain ontology, but again, this is influenced by the Vaisheshika. So the ver, uh, reference to Gunas also uh, points to a different strata, a different layer in Jain ontology, which relates that these layers of Jain ontology to the 
substance ontology, based on substance, and not based on astikayas. As I mentioned in the beginning, astikayas were conceived as a very distinct uh, part of Jain philosophy, very distinct ontology, which was uh, developed by Jains themselves, uh, and it was their own ontology, not adopted or borrowed from anyone else, and it was not understood by others. So again, the usage of gunas in the context of astikayas is a kind of foreign body. It, it, it shows uh, later influence. Um, now, reminding you that Gatha five enumerated the five astikayas, we go down to Gatha uh, 22, which describes uh, uh, which begins with the description of, of jiva. Uh, so this is, in the text, it is the natural continuation of Gatha 5. So there are more reasons why after Gatha 5 there is the whole interpolation and the text continues only beginning with Gatha 22. Uh, because it's a natural continuation after enumeration of all five astikayas, Gatha 22 starts with the first astikaya. Uh, and as I say, between Gatha 6 and uh, 21, uh, we have the discussion of many other elements. Um, I'll go back, uh, I'll go down to the, the end of the real, uh, uh, of the, uh, to the real end of uh, Panchastikaya Sangraha, which is, um, yeah, I have to skip some material, a lot of material, um, to Gatha 103 and 4. Mm, sorry for this, but Gatha 103 and 4 present the actual end of the text. Uh, yeah, they are here. Uh, in this way, having comprehended the essence of sermons being the, uh, the compendium of the five extensive entities, the one who abandons passion and aversion attains the freedom from suffering. Having understood this meaning of the treatise, such a living being becomes elevated by an, uh, the ensuring understanding of it, that is, delusion is removed, its passion and aversion are subdued, its trans transmigration is ended. So this is the real end of Panchastikaya Sangraha. But after this gatha, we have another 80 gathas, two more chapters. Uh, the next chapter will be based on a completely different um, ontology, which relates to uh, Dravyas, that is Vaisheshika ontology. And the third chapter, Chulika, this minor clause, uh, presents again a completely different material, which is a compilation on the path to liberation. So uh, Pancha Astikaya Sangraha, as we see it, is rather incoherent in its structure. Uh, and proper analysis will show different historical layers. Um, now, I will... Uh, Go to one more point. Uh, I was not prepared to talk about this in the beginning, but then just before coming here, uh, I thought I should add some more comments on two other works of Kunda Kunda. So, uh, um, uh, Pavaya Nasara, Pravacha Nasara. Uh, again, uh, like the previous text, um, uh, it is never, it doesn't exist on its own in manuscripts. Just to quote, quote Upadhi, also uh, Pavanasara, manuscripts of Pravachanasara generally contain one or the other commentary along with the text for various reasons. Even if some manuscripts without a commentary are available, they are so late in the age that there is every possibility of being copied from some manuscript with a commentary, which means that all uh, manuscripts uh, preserve. Uh, all these three Kundakunda -kunda works 
as a part of commentaries. What is important, both commentaries by Amrita Chandra and Jayasena present slightly different readings in the sense that Jayasena adds more verses. Uh, if I'm given five more time, uh, five more minutes, I will be able to explain why it is uh, important. Um, and then, uh, well, uh, Pravachana, uh, Pravachana Sara has, a, again, it is perhaps most consistent of all these, uh, more consistent than Panchastikaya Sangraha, but again, it's a compilation. And now Samaya Sara has the same features. It is always a part of co two commentaries. Um, I'll, it begins uh, uh, by producing uh, the ontology by describing the, uh, the jivas, and in the context of describing jivas, uh, uh, it begins to talk of uh, vavahara and sudho. The commentators, later commentators, will, will take these as two uh, nayas, two viewpoints. But these are not, and even Amrita Chandra does not take these as viewpoints, as nayas. Um, uh, Sudho is the pure cognizer, the soul who cognizes in a pure way. And um, uh, this soul, uh, and this is important, um, the soul is described with reference to uh, uh, to Vyavahara. Uh, Vyavahara here simply means uh, everyday life, the practice. It has no. Uh, I don't have time to exp to go into details, semantic details of of this gatha. Uh, but this is consistent when we read six gatha six and seven. They belong together, and uh, gatha six presents the soul as the knower, pure knower, uh, and the distinction of apramatta and pramatta, uh, ca uh, careful and careless, are unimportant uh, uh, for the actual pure soul. Um, now, Gatha's, Gatha 9 uh, still continues with reference to the term Vyavahara, uh, but uh, it speaks of um, the, the only pure thing, the essence of the soul. Uh, and um, the, it connects to the next verse, number 10. And the one who has this pure soul is Shuta Kevalin. Again, these two gathas present slightly different contexts. We have a hara in both in Gatha 6, 7, and 9, 10, uh, is used, but in two different meanings. Uh, well, I should need more time to explain this, so I'm just giving you a br brief impression of how it works. And uh, now, Gatha 11 and 12, they change the context again. Um, uh, we suddenly have... Uh, the pure point of view. Uh, but the point of view is uh, Shuddha Naya, um, and Yavahara apparently seems to be also uh, uh, Shuddha na uh, Naya. And, uh, sorry, uh, Yavahara is also a viewpoint. What is important, Yavahara is described here as Abhuta Artha. Yavahara is this point of view which the, the contents of which is not the true thing. This approach is, is irreconcilable with Gatha, uh, we had it, with Gatha 8, which, uh, yes, got, yeah, it is the, uh, the last line, uh, where Vyavahara is the way, the pr practical life is the way to determine uh, the ultimate truth in the context of pure soul. In other words, the pure soul can be determined as knowing the ultimate truth through practice. So we can see that the point of reference of the term Vyavahara is completely different. Um, now, to recapitulate these few verses, uh, the first Vyavahara, I mean, we have a small ontology here of um, 
verses which deal with the term Yavahara, but each of these segments deals with different meaning of, Yav of Yavahara. It seems like a collection of verses which simply were put together because the term Yavahara was in all of them. But each segment, like 6, 7, 8, then 9, 10, and then 11, 12, they deal with the term Yavahara in completely different meanings. They, these verses simply do not belong together. So apparently it was taken by Amrita Chandra and incorporated in this collection because this anthology probably existed before. He himself interprets Vyavahara only starting with Gatha 11 as Naya. He knows very well that in earlier Gathas, Vyavahara is not Naya, so he was aware of the different, uh, difference of meaning. Nonetheless, he included this kind of short anthology on Vyavahara term uh, into his work. Uh, basically, I should stop here, but one last minute. Should I explain? Uh, because the puzzling thing is uh, why this collection, why these verses were collected, and what was the reason? One minute, how's that? Yeah. Okay, one minute. Uh, it was the, the late period. Uh, what was... What is important, in most works of Kunda Kunda, we have uh, no reference to elements which crop up later when we analyze the layers, historical layers. So we have verses which deal with the intention. This is what is often emphasized with Kunda Kunda. Earlier uh, portions of Kunda Kunda's works do not contain the, this point of reference. It is only later uh, layers of Kunda Kunda's work which say that basically people's intentions are much more important than their actual conduct. This is clearly a response to a very serious problem which, which Jain ethics found in the same way, for instance, as, as Buddhist ethics with respect to lay community. Um, it, basically, to follow all the regulations of the Jain Vinaya, so to say, it was impossible. You would always have to commit transgressions. Not only with respect, with respect to monks, but also with respect to the lay community. So uh, Buddhists uh, dealt with the problem by the transfer of, um, of merit from bodhisattva, for instance, and by the mechanization of religious practices. You can mu multiply your merit in a me mechanical way, so, uh, so to say. And this was, again, uh, a, a way of Jain ethics to deal with a problem. You, sh you did not transgress the code of conduct uh, if your intentions were pure. Uh, the problem, of course, was very serious because you could uh, inadvertently step on some animals and kill them, so it would be all fine. This was a serious Jain paradox then. Nonetheless, it was probably an appeal to later demands of, of uh, popular lay community among Jains. And that explains why suddenly Kunda Kunda became again so important uh, at the end of the 19th century and in the 20th century, because it was a useful way to deal with very rigid Jain ethics uh, in everyday life. Thank you. Thank you.